That's right. So I decided to give a very high level, entertaining sort of overview talk. Uh, some of you may have already seen parts of it. So let, let's, uh, let's get right into it. So usually when we look at complexity, or when we have looked at complexity in counting, then we have wondered whether it's in P or not in P. So is it in, or FP or not in P. So in exact counting, sort of the dichotomy is between P versus Sharpie hard. And in approximate counting, maybe we have a kind of trichotomy situation where it's either, either it has an approximation scheme or it's base complete or it's as hard to approximate as SAT. Uh, but really it comes down to can it be approximated in polynomial time or not under uh, reasonable complexity assumptions such as RP is equal to NP or not equal to NP. So um, I would argue that this is, this is all great, but maybe even once we have classified our problems according to this sort of setting, we want to know even more. Yeah, so the motivation for fine-grained complexity, and there was a program about this last semester here at Simons, which I attended, and this here is kind of my the advertisement uh, sort of talk for this uh, for this area. So the motivation is as follows: so even if you have a problem that's sharply hard, uh, then you could still want to solve it. And there are different sort of situations that you could be in, right? So it could be that the best running time is 2 to the n, or even 200 to the n, or it's 1.01 to the n, which is maybe already very efficient for the instances that you look at. Uh, or or you could have, could have some parameter in your input that's very small, and the, algor the algorithm runs in time, n to the k, or even two to the k times n. So there is a very different range of possibilities here. Um, and for problems in P, we have a similar sort of story. Well, how, how much in P is it? Like it has been argued or it has been said that uh, every problem in P is actually solvable in like cubic time or linear time, uh, every natural problem that is. But, uh, but there are actually examples of problems where we don't know linear time algorithm <laughs> or quadratic time algorithm. And we want to, also for problems in P, distinguish between the run, these different situations. Well, we don't even know that sharp P problems are not, in the sec are not on that second log. Yeah, so even assuming that P is not equal to sharp P, I, I understand. Just yeah, yeah, of, of course. Uh, this is all conditional, what I'm saying, and hypothetical. Okay, so, so fine-grained complexity gives you a toolbox. It, it will be a conditional toolbox. We can never prove things uh, anytime soon. So fine-grained complexity is a toolbox for pinning down the exact running times further. Okay, so what, so. Uh, what kinds of tools do we have? Well, in the, in the polynomial time world, we have various problems for which we know algorithms that we think may be the best algorithms possible. For example, the orthogonal vectors problem uh, is the problem where you're, giving a bunch of, you're given a bunch of vectors and you want to find two of them that are orthogonal. The best uh, known algorithms, um, it's believed that they are uh, actually optimal. Um, and the all pair of shortest path problem, so the best known algorithm there is uh, cubic time, and it's believed that it's not better than cubic time. Um, and similar for threesome, it's a quadratic time. Uh, there is a quadratic time algorithm, and it's, it's believed, or it's at least a reasonable assumption that we can use to build up some, some complexity. Uh, is that n cube is actually the n, n square is actually the best uh, possible for for this sort of uh, thing. Um, but in the counting world, we don't really we don't have I don't have anything that specifically relates to counting in the polynomial time world. Uh, therefore, I will focus on the other side, 
And there we have parameterized complexity, which, we'll, which Radu will talk about later this week. And we have the sort of the exponential time setting, which is the focus of this talk. Um, so let's, uh, just as a quick starter, let's look at how we can actually be faster than exhaustive search. So for example, for three CNF set, there is Schoening's algorithm, which is based on a, a Markov chain method. It's very simple. You randomly start from a random, you start from a random assignment for the variables. There are n variables. And uh, then if there is a clause that's not satisfied by the assignment, if there is no clause that's not satisfied by the assignment, you found your satisfying assignment, we're done. If there is a clause that's not satisfied, well, then we, we pick a random literal in that clause and we flip it. Doing so will now satisfy the clause. Uh, and hopefully it brings us closer to a satisfying assignment. And then there is a restart process, uh, which, uh, which we, uh, so they're, they're in the, in the if, the, if this while loop takes too long, we just restart this whole process and sample from a completely new uh, <coughs> assignment. Start from a completely new assignment. So let's, the analysis goes something like this. So let's assume we have some satisfying assignment somewhere, and let's plot the Hamming distance of the assignments that we look at. Well, a random assignment will have half of the variables set correctly and half of them not correctly in expectation. Uh, with, some, with some probability, even uh, more than half of them will be set correctly, and that's actually also exploited in the, in the analysis. And then when you flip a value, well, with probability one-third, uh, you know that the satisfying assignment has uh, the completely, it doesn't, have, doesn't agree with the non-satisfying assignment on this clause. So you, so you know that you have to flip at least one of these <coughs> variables to get closer to the satisfying assignment. And with probability one-third, you go, get closer. And with probability at most two-third, you get further away from this. Okay, so, so this uh, sort of is a very simple Markov chain on a, on a path because you're just looking at the distance here, either the distance gets smaller or, or bigger. And if you analyze this with the, with the restart and, uh, and the fact that actually with some probability more than half of the variables are set correctly initially already, you can uh, get the running time of four thirds to the n. Th that's the expected running time of this, of this algorithm. And it, it's a decision algorithm, okay? So you can't, you can't really count this way. The worst case for this worse than the exhaustive search worst case? Um, pardon me? So that's the expected running time, but suppose, you know, it's, uh, it's a bad, it's a very clever uh, graph or something, you know, can, can this algorithm do worse than the exhaustive search? Um, so it depends on how you define randomized algorithm. So you can just repeat it a constant number of times, for example. <clears throat> and if it, never, it, if it never finds a satisfying assignment, you just abort. And then you, you claim that uh, there is no satisfying assignment, but maybe you make an error. Right? It's, it's kind of a, <clears throat> a one-sided error that you can make here. Or you can just uh, let it run forever, and in expectation, this will be the running time. These are two equivalent sort of views. Uh, okay, but this does not count. So a different method that can count is, is a branching algorithm. So here we have a formula, a 3 CNF formula, and let's say it has some clause ABC. And let's say we branch on the variables, on these literals in order. So either A is 1 or A is 0. If A is 1, then the clause is satisfied, and we don't sort of look at it uh, anymore in the analysis. Um, then B can be 1 or 0, and C can be 1 or 0, except that it can't be that all three literals are 0. So there is one case that we can just exclude. We don't have to branch from this one. 
So in total, for every class, sort of, we only need to look at seven out of the eight possible assignments. And that gives an improvement over exhaustive search. Uh, so now we, we only need seven to the n third time. Okay, and this, this analysis is extremely crude, so you can, do it, you can do it much better and improve this constant. And in fact, you can improve the, the rule by which, you, by which you choose which variable to branch on next <coughs> more cleverly. Like you would probably want to branch on high degree variables, so variables that occur very often first. Uh, and if you do this, then you get an exact algorithm that has 1.64 to the end running time. <clears throat> and that, that's the currently best known. It has been proven a long time ago. <laughs> Thanks. So that's 2007 BC. Yes. <laughs> okay, and then um, why would we only look at exact counting? We could also be interested in approximate, or we are interested in approximate counting. And Mark uh, Thurley actually proved and gave an algorithm, an approximation algorithm, that has a faster sort of exponential running time for satisfiability. And this is the only algor approximation algorithm for SAT <coughs> that has ever been sort of devised um, in this, in this uh, for three SAT sort of, in this generality. Um, yeah, and now, given that we can do faster than two to the n, one question is how, will it be a constant to the n? Will the best algorithm run in time constant to the n? And the exponential time hypothesis says that yes. So there is a constant delta such that counting CNF set for three CNF formulas cannot be done in time one plus delta to the n. Yeah, so um, if delta happens to be 0 0.6423, then we already have found the best algorithm, but this seems rather, I mean, we have no reason to think that this is the, this should be the final answer. <clears throat> and so one important um, lemma in this, in this context to make this a robust sort of hypothesis and theory is the sparsification lemma which says that we can actually assume that the number of clauses in the three sad formula is linear when, when you consider delta to be a constant. So the hard case is where uh, the formula is sparse in this sense. So let me say this a bit more precisely. So the input is a KCNF formula with n variables and n clauses. And also you get an epsilon as an input parameter which will uh, feed into the running time and the sparsity that you want to achieve. And the output is now a bunch of KCN of formulas so that actually the, satisfying, the set of satisfying assignments of the input formula is, can be written as the disjoint union of the satisfying assignments of the output formulas. Yeah, and since it's a disjoint union, this reduction can also be used in the counting setting. It's a parsimonious uh, thing that's going on here. And moreover, every output uh, formula has, a, has k over epsilon to the k uh, density. <coughs> and there are only very few output formulas. Okay, so the, the running time of this algorithm is polynomial in its output. Uh, actually, it's t times the polynomial, and t is sub-exponential. So t is two to the epsilon n. So as epsilon, uh, if epsilon is very small, this will allow us to say something about uh, precise exponential running times for linear sort of uh, instances or problems, problems on sparse instances. Okay, let's move on. So gen in general CNFs, so not only three CNFs that, uh, for general CNFs we can also get some savings over exhaustive search. Uh, for example, Chan and Williams did this here in a deterministic algorithm. So they compute the number of satisfying assignments 
in time 2 to the n times 1 minus some savings. And the savings they get depend on the, on the um, structure of the formula. So if it's a KCNF, the savings is <coughs> proportional to 1 over k. And if f is sparse, so if it has c times n clauses, but k may be large in this case, then the savings is 1 over log c. Okay, so, so in, in any case, as k goes to infinity, we don't become better than brute force here. We, 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 we have, uh, so we don't have an algorithm that is better than 2 to the n for all k, or for general CNF set. We don't have that. And, and therefore, we have the strong exponential time hypothesis, which you may or may not believe, which is that actually this is, this, uh, this is true in general. So no algorithm can have savings more than delta that for all k. So for all, del for, all, for all delta, there is a large k such that kcnf set cannot be solved or counted with savings better than delta. So uh, this means that CNF side cannot be done in 1.999 to the n. So okay, so once we have this hypothesis, which problems, which problems are equivalent to it? I mean, in uh, in the classical polynomial time world, we have SATs, and then we have all the NP-complete problems or sharp complete problems. But under, under the strong ETH, the old reductions, they may or may not work. And uh, in fact, we've been, we know very few problems that are equivalent to a CNF set under these strong ETH preserving reductions. So in the decision world, we have problems such as hitting set. So finding a hitting set of size k, that's a vertex cover in a, in a hypergraph or not all equal set, these problems that are very close to CNF set, they still remain uh, equivalent. So one has a faster than two to the n algorithm if the other has, if and only if the other one has. But these reductions are already quite uh, surprisingly non-trivial. You, you cannot use the standard <coughs> NP hardness reduction. <coughs> and then interestingly, it's open whether set covers of size t, uh, having a faster algorithm for this, whether that's equivalent to strong ETH. Okay, so what did we learn from counting complexity? Well, if we don't, if we can't continue on the decision world, so if we can't get the dichotomy for the decision problem, which sort of arises uh, quite a bit, for example, the feta Valley conjecture, uh, is an instance of this where we, we don't know whether the dichotomy holds or whether uh, certain hardness reductions exist. We look at the counting version. And here, let's say we could look at counting modulo 2. And in counting modulo 2, we have this equivalence as well. And of course, we can always reduce from the decision version to the counting version using an isolation lemma. So the original um, invariant versus Ivalia isolation lemma does not work here because you have to do it more efficiently. Um, it, has to be, it has to be encoded into a KCNF, and you cannot encode arbitrary linear equations into a KCNF, so you need to do it with sparse linear equations. <coughs> um, and so the point is that in the counting world, we do get an equivalence to, <clears throat> to set covers. So counting hitting sets of a certain size is actually, it turns out to be equivalent to counting all hitting sets. And this, surprisingly, modulo 2, is equal to the problem of counting all set covers. And it's equal to the problem of counting bipartite independent sets, modulo 2. So this is hard, and from there, there is a reduction to set covers modulo 2 of size t, yeah? set covers of size t, although the back reduction is not known. And we also have a decision to parity reduction from set cover down here. 
just to complete this picture. Okay. So, the, so the, we understand the counting world a little bit better than the decision world, which is, uh, yeah, so that's a good thing. Let's move on. Um, yeah, I'm just talking about the several results in this area. So, as I said, just an overview. Um, let's look at perfect matchings. So we have the matrix that corresponds to this uh, bipartite graph. These are some perfect matchings. And the number of perfect matchings is equal to the permanent of the, of the matrix. And that's equal to the sum of all permutations. And then, then you take this, this product. So, so how, how fast can you compute the permanent? Well, one algorithm um, is as follows. You just use this formula. And that will take time d factorial, roughly, where d was the dimension of the matrix. Um, but d factorial is not, so is not the best you can do. You can actually do it faster using inclusion exclusion. So you write the set of permutations as the set of all functions. So, so let's say instead of the permutations, we look at all functions. This. Uh, some you can express using uh, some polynomial size <coughs> algebraic circuit. So this is just a product of polynomially many things, of the sum of polynomially many things. Uh, but now, of course, we overcounted. We counted functions that are not surjective, say. So we remove them. So we remove all functions that don't hit a certain uh, element. But now we undercounted because there are functions that don't hit two elements uh, and so on. So it's just inclusion exclusion, uh, which uh, yields Riser's formula. This, but this is long ago. So uh, this uh, gives us a running time of 2 to the d, roughly. Yeah, so we went down from d factorial to 2 to the d, which is arguably better. But we don't know, we don't really know whether this is optimal. So, so let's look at uh, lower bounds. The, the only thing that's known at this point is, is under ETH, under number ETH, that uh, the permanent cannot be computed in, in sub exponential time, not in 2 to the little of d. Um, let me mention another upper bound. So if A has, if A is sparse, so this is also analogous to the satisfiability case. If A is sparse, then you can compute it better than 2 to the n, 2 to the d. And in light of this and the fact that we have a 50 year old algorithm that has not been improved, we may we could look at the hypothesis that the permanent can actually not be computed faster than 2 to the d. So it, it would be something like this. Uh, so the permanent is not in time 2 minus uh, delta to the d. For, and you can make it even uh, gradual, like in the limit, for, if you look at sparse matrices. Um, yeah, since I'm running out of time, let me quickly go over this. Uh, so you can also count perfect matchings in general graphs as fast as, as you can compute Riser's formula. And I guess this would also be an instance of a problem where that is hard under the permanent exponential time hypothesis. So you cannot do this faster unless you can do the permanent faster. <coughs> And here I'm just showing that the chromatic polynomial is a polynomial. Um, I was just saying, OK, so th this algorithm, the deletion contraction algorithm for the chromatic polynomial takes 2 to the m time. You can also do it in vertex exponential time, but probably not better than that. And on the strong ETH, we don't know. Um, then we have the top polynomial, which I don't sort of need to define in this crowd. 
uh, it's just this polynomial that takes uh, edge exponential time. You can do it in vertex exponential time. It's the same story. And uh, you can probably not do it better than that. And let me give the uh, obligatory picture for the TUT plane. Um, I, I'm, just, I'm only showing this in order to highlight the open problem. Uh, okay, so we have this dichotomy. Some points of the uh, TUT polynomial can be computed in polynomial time. Most of the points are hard under ETH, under sh sharp ETH. Uh, but this line, the yellow line, is open under sharp ETH. And it's a very, if I made no mistake, it's a, a very simple problem. It's a forest counting problem. So you sum over all forests, seen as subsets of the edges. And uh, uh, the weight of the forest is 2 to the number of edges in the forest. Okay, so this problem is sharply hard, but we don't know uh, whether it's hard under ETH or number ETH. Um, here I wanted to say, I'm running out of time, so I wanted to say something about block interpolation, which Radu introduced to prove the previous result. Um, so the basic idea is that you, instead of looking at univariate interpolation, you look at multivariate interpolation, and you uh, uh, make sure that every variable that you use in the, in the interpolation has um, a constant degree. And then this allows you to only use a constant number of different gadgets in the reductions. You don't need, you don't need a large number of different reduction, uh, gadgets. Um, okay, and this, this technique can be used to rule out sub-exponential time algorithms. Okay. Um, one word about approximate counting. So if, if we have an NP oracle, then there is an F plus for a number set. And in this exponential time world, we have some word of an analogy here. If C and F set can be decided in time c to the n for some c less than 2, then actually you can get some kind of f-press or some kind of approximation, which is 1 plus some exponentially small number. So it's much better than a constant approximation in time c plus uh, some very small number. Okay, So if you can decide set faster than two to the n, then you can also approximate set faster than two to the n. That's the gist of this. And then lastly, so if the strong ETH is true, then C and F set takes time two to the n. You cannot do it faster. Number C and F set also takes time two to the n, even approximating number C and F set. And QBF set takes time to do that. So, sort of, um, these problems are all the same. And the question, the question would be, my question, why would we, why would we even look at counting complexity? Why wouldn't be it be enough to study problems under sort of decision complexity assumptions? Um, but maybe one one hope is that in practice. Um, we observe that C and F set is easier than QBF set, so it might still be. So, so uh, it might still be possible to say that uh, there could be a, a kind of Toda theorem also in this exponential time setting, which would be a reduction from QBF set to counting C and F set, um, which would then say that counting is harder than decision, at least in practice. Okay, uh, I'm going to just mention this open problem or leave these open problems here and uh, thank you for your attention. Exactly. <laughs> well, 
looking at exponential time uh, solutions. As computers become faster, exponential time is sort of feasible. Is there any one of these algorithms that uh, is actually, in any sense, practical? Oh, I mean, SAT solvers are based on on DPLL style algorithms, yeah, which. Yeah, it's this branching process that I showed in the beginning. That and, of course, some heuristic techniques. Um, but, but they don't need to actually do, do sort of enumeration, though. They don't do enumeration, no, but there are variants where they do that, I guess. Thank Holger again. Thank you.